Dr. Karen. Okay, awesome. So I'm a, I'm a practicing physician in Southern Colorado. I spent 18 years as a teaching physician in inner city Detroit at Wayne State University and decided to move back to Colorado where I grew up. And in the process, I took a job in Southern Colorado. I started in 2013. So I started a year before legalization. And I too, like many of the public, thought it's just marijuana, so it can't be all that bad. So I wouldn't have had an opinion either way. Um, but I've changed my opinion in the last five years because of what I've seen on pretty much a daily basis in my um, emergency department. I work in the third busiest emergency department in Colorado. We're in southern Colorado, so our catchment area for traumas, et cetera, is all of southern Colorado and some of northern New Mexico. So I um, tried to figure out what it was that was making people so invested in cannabis. I actually took a cannabis science and medicine course at the University of Vermont, so I do have a certificate in cannabis science, so at least I have some better understanding of some of the chemical properties of this. As a disclosure, and I think when you're hearing people talk, you need to feel, uh, hear what their disclosure is. I don't own any marijuana properties. I don't own any businesses, and I don't make any money. By speaking out, I feel like I need to speak out because the public really needs to hear what we have to say. Um, just a brief review of some of the things because I find that most people don't really understand some of the basic chemistry of marijuana. If you took a joint from Woodstock, if you got a really good joint, you probably had three milligrams of THC. If you got an average one, it was one. So basically, the milligrams in a joint in Woodstock were one to three milligrams of THC. The current Colorado joint has 18 to 25 milligrams. So you can see the difference. So if you said, let's just say it was two milligram joint from Woodstock, and I smoked one now in Colorado, and you're even now hard pressed to find one with 18 milligrams, so we'll say 20 milligrams. It is the equivalent of smoking 10 Woodstock joints at the same time. That just gives you an idea of how it's changed in concentration. Then if we go even further, the industry has made it so that we do dab, wax, or shatter. And dab, wax, and shatter is a concentrate and a distillate of THC, and it's 90% THC. It's these pictures down here are what it looks like. And it's typically smoked in a rig or a bong, and sometimes you use a blowtorch to light it, to vaporize it, to smoke. It is probably the fastest way to get high. Um, but you can smoke upwards of 200 milligrams in a dab, 225. So you can see, if we took that down, we said the average Woodstock joint is two milligrams, and I'm gonna do a dab, I'm smoking 100 milligrams. And I have patients who tell me they smoke 5,000 milligrams of THC a day. They will do 10 to 20 dabs a day. Um, then we talk about edibles. Edibles were made. Um, we now have a law in Colorado where we have to put the dose or the proportion of milligrams per dose. But you can see if you're looking, this is a dose of, of THC. This is considered one dose. This is uh, called Fantastic Brownie, and if you ate the whole thing, you'd get 100 milligrams of THC. Again, that's 50 Woodstock joints, if we did the average. If you are five and you see this brownie, you're not gonna stop at one bite. If you're five or six or 10 and you see this candy bar, you aren't gonna stop at one dose. So what we saw in Colorado was a lot of these edibles, kids were overdosing on them because they were simply consuming the whole thing. The edible industry has done a lot, I don't know if I have pictures, no, has done a lot to make edibles look really appealing, so gummy bear edibles, candy edibles, and they were coming in packaging sizes, so there were a number of quantities. And kids would bring these edibles to school with them, give them to their friends, and we would see a whole group of kids getting sick at the school because they passed out the edibles. Some, uh, there's a guy who came to a lecture with me, 15 years old, at school, his friend said, you want a brownie? And the kid said, well, yeah. And he ate the whole thing, and it was one of those, oops, one of those brownies with uh, 100 milligrams of THC. So what is really happening in a community? And Pueblo is a community two hours south of Denver. We're on I-25, and we are a crossroads for the country. So 
Um, we're a small community. There's 160,000 of us in Pueblo County and there's 110,000 in Pueblo. In 2013, an organization called Posada, which helped, it was homeless outreach. We, in 2013, they served 2,500 homeless individuals or families. Um, by 2016, in the first six months alone, they had served 54 hundred individuals and that was in the first six months so you would see they were on record to have a 10,000 people request so this is from legalization and if you plot out their data we had and we were inundated with a number of homeless people or people coming simply to live in the area because they heard it was inexpensive and that they could smoke marijuana legally and enjoy that and our community which was always a poor blue cross community rapidly became inundated with homeless individuals and we had people living in campers and walmart parking lots we have people living down by the river and um, our county commissioner advertised this as the napa valley of cannabis and i'm here to provide the other side of the story for the napa valley of cannabis um, so again we had a number of people move um, the director of Posada and our homeless outreach like to say that people called it the land of Oz because we're a Medicaid expansion state, so it was very easy for people to move and get Medicaid. It was very easy to get social services and also very easy to get um, all kinds of other benefits. So we had a lot of people move into our community. A lot of people moved there thinking that they could come and smoke pot and work in the pot industry because they thought there were jobs aplenty. In the early 2000s, Pueblo was listed as one of the top 20 communities to live in the country. By 2018, we were the 17th worst to live in the country. And this is on this, you can Google it. Uh, we are dealing with crime and homelessness and issues in the community that go well beyond just our area. In 2018, by looking at the records, we had about 110,000 people living there of those 110,000 people in Pueblo, 69,000, a little over 69,000 of them were on Medicaid. So, and then 40%, I think it, in 2018, it was like 44% of the community was on some kind of disability. So you can see what kind of community, what kind of community structure we had. And it was pretty difficult to get people to come to the community as far as healthcare providers for us. Um, what happened to our schools? Because our governor has gotten up and said, oh, it's not affecting the schools and kids aren't smoking more. This year, we have had, if you just have to Google it, no one has to take my word, Google it. District 60, Pueblo, school district and chronic absenteeism rate. This year, our absenteeism rate for all comers in Pueblo school district is 38%. Can you imagine a school district with 38%? That's over one third of our kids and our community are not making it to school. Um, the cause is listed as many, but one of the school people, uh, one of the uh, District 60 teachers said they thought it was apathy from the parents. Indeed, I saw a kid who was 10 who'd been sick, and I said, well, when was the last time he went to school? And the mom said, oh, it's been over a week. And I said, well, has he been that sick? And she said, no, I just didn't take him to school. So how did that change our medical community? Because this is what I can really speak to. There are two hospitals in our community. One, um, both of them are old, both of them are over 100 years. Because we had such poor services or such poor reimbursement, one of the hospitals um, recently dramatically cut services and all but closed. They have, I think, they have 30 beds, which left the hospital that I'm at, which was already the third busiest in the state, we're basically overwhelmed. When I first started in 2013, our wait time was less than an hour. And now currently our wait times on average are five to seven hours. And um, so it's really put a strain on the community. Additionally, we're having trouble recruiting providers to come and provide outpatient care. How do we get them here when we say this is our payer mix and this is our community? And so unless we're hiring them through the hospitals, we have lost a ton of community providers. And so people are now coming to the emergency department, which is overwhelming us again, to get their care. And this has really been difficult. So what it means to the individual, that I will see the screaming psychotic patient and the older person with a GI bleed will sit out in the waiting room while I see the screaming psychotic patient. And so 
That's what's happened in our emergency department. Hospital layoffs here in this picture here. This was the other hospital in town. Our hospital has been running at 120% occupancy, meaning as soon as somebody's out of a bed, we have somebody else putting them in. We are now holding patients in the emergency department, and so it's become a pretty big issue for our area. Some of the things that really, as a physician, bother me is to look at the ads that we're seeing. This was a full-page ad done two years ago in January where it says it, it cures cancer. Right, but, and, and you would think, well, okay, we all know that it doesn't really cure cancer. And if you look at it scientifically, maybe, maybe in the future we'll find that some part, there is over 400 chemicals in a, in a marijuana plant, that some part might, because there's some anti-inflammatory effects, but mostly with CBD. But to put an ad in the paper that says it cures cancer and treats seizures, it's just really false advertising. And who do we get to hold harmful for this? I personally have placed three patients in the last two years directly from the ER into hospice because the marijuana treatment plan they chose didn't cure their cancer. Who do those families hold harmful for? Because there's no one that we've been able to, to get to hold harmful for. This is a list of things that marijuana can treat. The list goes on. No, many of these are not founded. And so it's really this, it's advertising at its best. I mean, it's a, uh, it's really um, without control. Here's another one. It's coming in, check us out. We cure arthritis and cancer and chronic pain and Crohn's and seizures and PTSD and all kinds of things. And there may be some, but we have not reached it yet. And there is no medical society that says, let's do um, marijuana for, or, for seizures or for chronic pain or for a lot of other things. And there's a lot of literature out that shows that it actually sometimes causes bad effects. Now, does it work on seizures? Yes, it might. It's CBD that works on the seizures. And we have a new medicine called Epidiolex that was put out to treat seizures. And it's, it's a pharmaceutical grade, which means that you're getting the same product every time you buy it, the same concentration. And, you, and it was rushed through the FDA, but we know that when they did those trials, there were kids who died and there were kids who had worsening seizures based on using this medication. So it's not a medicine if you're buying it from the dispensary. This is a wheel of all the things that leaf fly, which is a big one in uh, Colorado and California. This is all the things that THC can treat. Um, so we have to deal with that. So what are we seeing in the emergency department? What's taking up all of my time? Um, there's a tremendous number of increased visits. We're seeing overdoses, accidental exposures, ingestions, acute psychosis, adolescent drug use, um, hyperemesis syndrome, some cardiovascular side effects and disease, pulmonary problems, depression, anxiety, suicidality. These are just a few of the things that we are seeing. So one of the big things that we see, I remember 10 years ago when I was teaching residents in Detroit, we said hyperemesis related to cannabinoids, that's really rare. And we wrote up a case report because it was so rare. We see this every day now. It's also called scrometing um, because it's a combination of screaming and vomiting. It's very uncomfortable is my understanding. I can close my eyes and I can hear it in the back and say it's scrometing. Um, these people tend to visit a lot of at the ER a lot. And we don't know why a certain portion of the population will have scrometing. We don't know what causes it, but we do know the cure is abstinence. And a lot of times they will get frequent ER visits. I saw one man seven times, actually five times in seven days. He was in his early 30s. And he kept coming in with extreme abdominal pain and persistent vomiting. And he wanted everything done. He had been, in his previous ER visits, he'd been scoped. He'd been CAT scanned. He'd been CAT scanned again. He'd had labs done. He'd been hydrated. And he always tested positive for cannabis. And finally, I suggested to him that it might be the marijuana, here's some reports, here's some literature. And I thought his father, who was on the other side of the bed, was going to hit me. He stood up and started yelling at me, that's just marijuana, and I've smoked pot every day of my life, and I'm fine. So like I said, we don't know who's going to get hyperemesis, but we do know people get it. And I'm going to guess that we see one to two cases a day, probably more. I see probably one, at least one, every shift. And let's just look at a few of the costs associated with that. If we say that a level four ER visit, which this is what it is, 
cost $2,600, CT scan roughly $3,400, and a physician charge is $3,500. Mind you, these are bills. These are totally not what we're reimbursed. Um, if you add that up just for one person, one visit a day with one diagnosis just to our ER, you're, you're looking at $2.3 million of cost. So this is being paid mostly in our case by Medicaid. So who's paying for that? Everybody working in the room. We're paying for that. $2.3 million for one person for one day, one visit a day in one ER. And how many ERs do we have? Over 50 in Colorado. So imagine the cost there. We can't, you can't say that, that you're going to make enough money in taxes to save the community and pay this kind of money out. Just as one, that's just one example. Without question, there is no question, our youth are using more. And they're using more and they're using younger. Um, a lot of them are getting it from their parents because their parents tell them it's natural and it's an herb and they can use it and they're getting it from their parents. And, and until you've seen a young adolescent who's psychotic, you haven't really seen it and you don't understand why I'm up here talking today, but I've seen it. Um, I just want to take this time to tell you a few stories because if I tell you their story, then they will be remembered. I saw a 13-year-old male just over the holiday. He smoked some hubba bubba. And he came into the emergency department acutely psychotic, requiring antipsychotics, requiring several people to restrain him while I got them, and hours of observation. We don't know why, but in adolescence, the younger brain is really affected. And we don't know why certain people, and I think you will speak to it, become psychotic. And we don't know if when they stop using, the psychosis will go away. So we don't know that there's, a, we don't know what the association is, but there is an association between use and schizophrenia. I saw a 16-year-old male who came to the emergency department acutely psychotic. And his story was that he was on vacation in North Carolina and he had an, a psychotic break. It was so bad that his parents said, we can't get you in the plane, so they drove out and brought him back. And they brought him to our emergency department. And at that time, he was sedated and he improved and he tested only positive for THC. That's the only drug he ever used. There's no family history of psychosis. There's no family history of mental illness. He was admitted to our adolescent unit, which was off-site. And within a few days, he had another psychotic episode. And that time, he attacked three of our healthcare workers. He attacked three nurses and he stabbed a security guard in the face. During that time, he got tased three times and it required the sheriff to come in, handcuff him so we could chemically sedate him. But because our resources are so limited with regards to mental health care and addiction care, he was released within two weeks. And within two weeks, he was back in the emergency department in handcuffs under arrest because he had attacked a family member so bad that he ended up in the ICU. So what is the cost to the community of this 16-year-old who is now going to spend time in, in prison and the cost to the community for the injury that his family members had? I saw another 15-year-old girl who came in acutely psychotic with a spit mask on. If you don't know what that is, it's a big, looks like a beehive bonnet. It's because they're spitting and swearing and no one else wants their spit. So she came in with six police officers holding her down. It took us six people to hold her down enough to give her antipsychotics. And why did this get precipitated? Because she was smoking a joint on the side of her house and her mom told her to put it down. And she'd had recurrent acute psychotic breaks. And again, no family history of psychosis, no family history of mental illness, and the only drug she used was that. Two days ago on my last shift over the holidays, I saw an 18-year-old male who came to the emergency department with a chief complaint of anxiety. And he was a senior in high school, and he told me he had started smoking pot with his friends. He was smoking pot every day. He was dabbing. And that he moved to LSD and cocaine because he wanted something bigger and better. And then he came in anx anxious. 18, I asked him how his grades were doing. He said, well, I'm failing now. What's the cost to us as a group if we lose this 18-year-old guy at the age of 18 to addiction problems? I saw a 16-year-old male in the trauma room. He came to me after being hit by a car because he was out smoking his bike while or riding, riding a bike and smoking marijuana. He came to the trauma room and he had some injuries and his dad came. And I was asking him his social history and he's like, I smoke pot every day. He was no longer in school. And his dad sat there in the trauma room with him laughing because they thought it was really cool. He was a cool dad because he was the one getting him marijuana. And the last story I want to say is that you can say as a community, 
we're not going to have pot in our community. It's not going to happen here in Des Plaines. But I went out to do some speaking to a group in Lamar, Colorado, which is a dry county. They don't have marijuana there. And here's what the soccer coach told me when I went out there. He said, parents will drive out to Pueblo or wherever. They either buy it legally or illegally. They bring it back to Lamar and they have their kids sell it at school. So we effectively created whole families as drug pushers. And he said, we're never going to stop this because this is how they make extra money. Again, it's a poor farming community. So the number one diagnosis in our adolescent treatment centers right now is cannabis use disorder. And unfortunately, we don't have enough money to get everybody treated. So they're usually under treated and put back on on the streets. Um, the number one substance associated with completed suicides in the 10 to 19 year old age group is cannabis. Um, and again, we talked about chronic absenteeism rate of 38%. And this is how our community is doing. And this is why I speak out because I see way too many kids in this in this situation. Here's what it looks like to me. This right here, my house is right across the street. They said, oh, illegal grows will go down. It'd be no problem. We're going to have legal and all the illegal grows will go down. This right here was a known Cuban cartel house. It was busted twice. This was the second time. This house, which is right across the street from a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist, they took their energy cable, dug under the, uh, under the garage driveway, and live tapped into the junction box so they could steal electricity. And they did the same with the water. This house was closed down for a second time as a Cuban cartel grow. And literally, my friend, if you walk out her front door, you look at this house with broken windows. And she's had her house on the market for over a year. And she's reduced the price by 100000 and can't sell her house. Because how do you sell that? Do you want your kid next to, as a parent, you wouldn't move into an area where they had that, where the Cuban cartels are armed. This is my brother who lives 90 miles away in a, in a city called Brighton, Colorado. He's a firefighter. This is taken from his backyard. It's across the street. This house is a huge house and burned to the ground, an illegal grow in the basement. And the reason why it burned to the ground is because when you have an illegal grow in the basement, they board up the windows so you can't see the lights going on. And, and they alter the electricity to get enough amperage in. And it burned to the ground. And firefighters can't go into this facility to fight the fire from within because they don't have any egress if the floor goes. So they fight these fires from out. So this is my brother 90 miles away. And this, I put this in because there's something about this in Colorado. And I spent years in Detroit, right in inner city Detroit. And never did I ever see people who put their kids out to beg for money in the corners like this. And this is my area, the good neighborhood, right? This is a woman. You can see her here. This is her son. And he looked like he was eight years old. And this is the car loaded with crap. But there was a man sitting in it from Florida. And never as a parent would I ever put my kid in a position where I begged for money with them in the Walmart parking lot. But you know what? This isn't the first or only time I've seen this. So this is why I'm here. How do I help this kid when he's not going to school, he's living in a car, and what is his social implications to this kid? And how do I get this kid back in so that he can succeed? What are his chances of succeeding and becoming successful if he's living in the back seat of a car from Florida in the Walmart parking lot. And that's why I speak. And that's it. And we'll answer questions at the end if you have any questions. Thank you for your time.